of course, the toughest part about training is uh, designing the patch, and once you do that, then you're ready to go fly. <laughs> Here we are on suit up morning, uh, putting on the ACES suit. Uh, four of us had the new suit. It's a, a very good design. Worked very well if we ever need it uh, for depressurization system. Uh, I'm sure it's going to work uh, very well. We also had the liquid cooling garment, which kept us very cool on ascent and, and during the entry. That's a, also a new improvement. Many people helped us over the year uh, getting ready to go launch into space, and it was great when we walked out uh, to see some of the smiling faces of the folks that have helped us over the uh, previous year and a half, and it was nice to, to wave at them and, and give them a smile as we departed for the launch pad. Of course, as you approach, it's the first time you've seen the, the launch pad when, when there aren't very many people around. This is a moment that takes me back to when I was about six years old and uh, I first decided I wanted to be an astronaut. And this is looking up at your rocket and uh, this sends shivers down my spine every time I think about it. And it was a special feeling as we went up the elevator. The main engines ignite uh, six seconds prior to liftoff and then of course the SRBs ignite. When you see the launch from a distance uh, in person or on cameras, it looks like the vehicle is climbing very slowly and stately. Uh, we are here to assure you that there's nothing slow about it. It's uh, <laughs> power and speed are the two words that come to mind. Uh, when the SRBs ignite, it's a pretty rough ride. A lot of vibration, shaking going on. Um, of course, seven million pounds of thrust, uh, and you can feel every one of those pounds. The first uh, rendezvous maneuver is done uh, right here on the launch pad. We wait until the launch pad is in plane with the mirror, and then we quickly launch. Uh, that occurred uh, shortly after midnight, and so it was a night launch. Pretty exciting going uphill. Uh, I especially like the uh, the view uh, that we see after we land. It was great seeing the view in the cockpit, but of course we're working the systems and making sure everything is working. SRB separate and we're on our way. Once we get on orbit, um, we have a nice exterior look of the space hab, which is the module that has all the experiments, in fact, 23 different experiments. Here you see myself, and uh, Veloji has a camera uh, as we open the hatch to space hab. Uh, the investigations included a variety of things from crystal growth to plant growth. Uh, we even uh, did uh, uh, the famous taste test that you heard about. <laughs> The experiments on board pretty much ran the entire complement of the kinds of experiments we do in space. This is a protein crystal growth experiment that uses a vapor diffusion apparatus. These trays are full of little vials of protein crystals dissolved in a solution. You pull the trays out, you can see the little chambers, little round circles in the center of the screen. Each one has a little droplet that contains the solution. And during the flight, these droplets, the half moon shapes you see, evaporate, leaving the protein crystal behind, and hopefully they get very large crystals from this experiment. We also had some other life sciences experiments on board. Back in the module, this is Vladimir <coughs> Titov working on the astroculture experiment, growing plants in a, the sort of equipment that hopefully we can use on space station in the future to grow things for astronauts to eat. This is a robot we had on board called Charlotte. You can see at the bottom right corner of the screen a cable. There are eight cables like that attached to the corners of Charlotte, which allows it to fly around like Charlotte in Charlotte's Web. It can turn switches, as you see it during, doing here. It can punch buttons. It has a camera. This view is from the camera on board Charlotte, so it can send pictures to the ground of how the experiments are performing in space, so it can be used to work experiments when a crew member is not available. What you're about to see here is the Odorax deploy. Uh, three spheres and three dipoles were launched. There goes one, another sphere, and a dipole. The, the purpose of this was to uh, calibrate the ground radars so in the future they can better track orbital debris. You all know about our jet problem. Uh, we worked this pretty hard the first couple days of the flight. We thought we were going to go into 33 feet. Um, here, you, OK, there's the oxidizer spewing out. And you can see this very well at the Terminator passes. But we thought we were going to go into 33 feet, but with the leaking jet, we knew that there'd be possibility we'd be limited to 400 feet or maybe even 1,000 feet. Uh, first, uh, first time we saw the station approximately 50 uh, miles uh, from us. Uh, and we receive, uh, uh, <laughs> in this time, we receive message from Station Mir uh, about uh, we have decision about 30 feet approach. 
This is the first time we've been able to show you how dramatic the speed looks on orbit. We're traveling at over five miles a second. It's the first time we've had other human beings in another spacecraft able to take our picture. We fly underneath the mirror slightly faster and then climb up in front of mirror co-altitude where we eventually slow down and fly co-speed. We fly the first third of the rendezvous from the front part of the cockpit just like they do on the Enterprise. Uh, you do all the burns uh, with the computers, computer guided and, and automatically controlled and then we fly to the, or float to the back of the, the vehicle, turn around, look uh, aft and, and fly the remaining portion of it manually. This is Valery uh, Polyakov. He's the cosmonaut who's been up there over a year now and will soon uh, set a record. Uh, this is Elena Kondakova uh, speaking to us on the shuttle. In fact, all the astronauts got a chance to uh, speak on our VHF radio uh, to the cosmonauts on Mir. It was very motivating. As Jim climbed up towards the, the V-bar, that's basically the horizontal line uh, tangent to the Earth where we're going to meet up with Mir. I was ranging with the laser, and meanwhile they were looking at us coming up. And this is something we only saw when we came back, and we appreciate how dramatic it is. In fact, what you're seeing here is sped up uh, twice normal speed, just so that we can uh, show it quickly. But I think even so, you can feel how, uh, how dramatic that is. In the foreground there, you see the, the, the uh, dark metal ring. That's a, uh, an adapter on the mirror for uh, scientific instruments. And then at the bottom right, that's a scientific instrument. I think it's a telescope. Once we were at about 400 feet, um, Jim arrested the approach to the mirror, and uh, we basically station kept there for a few minutes before we started our timed approach. Once that time it came up, uh, we basically had a, a window to make, and uh, Eileen kept us straight. Uh, we were flying uh, range rate commands using another laser tracking system, the trajectory control sensor, um, in the middle of the bay, ranging off the docking port here, which is the White Cross. And Jim will tell you what he's doing there. This is a view taken from one of the payload bay cameras, and it shows how stable the orbiter is as it approaches to the target. And very few inputs were required. Uh, we saw no motion from the solar rays. You see the solar rays slewing. We were in the low Z mode, essentially not pluming the station. Uh, we, of course, didn't want to damage something this beautiful. Uh, and again, you can see how precise the orbiter is. We didn't do very much. It just stayed in the right place. It's a little bit easier to fly than the simulators, and that's good. This is the view out of the window at uh, about 37 feet. And you can see Vladimir and I are both um, crashing into each other, trying to get as good a shot as the other. This is a pan that Vladimir made, um, and you can see the windows. There's Elena Kondakova with her knee. Yes, Elena Kondakova and me, we wave each other, and for you, of course. Uh, I don't know who was it. This is uh, somebody know, uh, new <laughs> on board station. This is Valery Polikov, and this is Commander uh, uh, Alexander Viktorenko, all of the time with the camera and uh, uh, show the movie, make movie. This is uh, uh, his uh, picture from Station Mir. Again, it shows how well the vehicle has been designed. Uh, after we uh, remained at our closest point of approach uh, for about 10 minutes with the, my uh, crew members helping me to make sure that we didn't go one inch closer than the flight rule limit of 10 meters, you can see the solar array slewing. Again, no motion at all from our jets. We saw no uh, interaction. After 10 minutes, we backed away uh, and proceeded out to 450 feet and initiated a fly around as, as a photo survey. In fact, this is one of the harder things for uh, Jim and I to sort of talk about in the cockpit. As we backed away, Mira maneuvered uh, so that we no longer had a center line towards the uh, docking port. And at 450 feet, we started to climb up above it and behind it uh, in our orbit plane so that we would do a full circle around it, basically trying to stay at 450 feet. During this time, however, using the laser, which was the handheld laser, which is the thing that a traffic cop would use to catch you for speeding, um, we basically couldn't find many reflective items on the mirror to get a range off. And so uh, we basically had to move out a little bit further than we first planned because of that uncertainty. But it was no problem, I think, for Jim. 
If anyone has any doubts about what we're doing in the future, uh, let us assure you that we're on the right track. You, you can't help but see a vehicle like this that's been up since 1986. It's just stunning, just breathtaking, and, and it, it really tells us that we're doing the right thing. We had met the Russian people before we launched, and they're very proud of their space program. They know a lot about our space program, and we, of course, are very proud of our space program. Uh, and it's time to join our forces and make both of our programs better. This is what 17,500 miles per hour looks like from the top. We have payload bay lights on board the shuttle that help illuminate the mirror. We could see it at 600 feet. And you'll see in the next shot, if you watch the top upper right corner of the screen, you'll see the jets on the mirror firing. We can see this, all the structure and things very clearly at night without any help. Look up right up in there, top right corner. What's going on there is it's de-state, it's, um, they have gyroscopes basically on the mirror to give it attitude control. And at some point, they become saturated, and then they fire jets to uh, desaturate the gyros. This is our parting shot, and it was a pretty sad moment, I think. We'd had a long day, it was busy, but one of the most exciting days in my life, I must say. The second major activity we had on this flight was the Spartan satellite. It had an ultraviolet telescope that's on the right side of the box, the gold box you saw in that picture. On flight day two, we took it out of its station in the payload bay to look at the shuttle. It's looking at the ultraviolet glow on the surface of the tail of the shuttle. Vladimir Titov, you can see at the controls on the robot arm here, he's flying the Spartan up above the nose of the shuttle so it can look back at the tail and at jets on the tail to fire and watch their glow. On flight day five, we released Spartan so it could go look at some stellar objects. Again, Vladimir Titov is flying the arm here. We let the Spartan go and then we watch it to make sure its attitude control system is working properly. When that's all been checked out, Jim flies the shuttle away at about one foot per second which allows Spartan to drift about 40 miles in front of the shuttle, where it can perform its observations undisturbed by the shuttle environment. The ultraviolet uh, telescope will be looking at diffuse nebula and other intergalactic objects, which can't be easily observed from the ground. You can see us doing ranging marks and looking at the Spartan to make sure all the deploy is going well. You see it in the center of the screen, that little black square is Spartan on its way. This is Mike and I preparing for uh, our big event, at least it was my favorite thing on the mission, and that was the EVA. Uh, we have to pump the suits up uh, without anybody's in it to make sure it's not leaking and then uh, get uh, ready for prep. Here I'm attaching electrodes to my chest. Both Bernard and I wore these during the EVA it's so that our flight surgeons can monitor our heartbeats during the spacewalk. And here we are getting ready for our uh, four hour hang on the wall while we uh, get to look at each other and uh, tell each other stories. <laughs> After they waved goodbye to us, we had to get right back on getting Spartan retrieved. Jim was flying the rendezvous here, and you can see Spartan coming up. The robot arm is in the bottom center of the screen. I'm performing the retrieve at this point. I'm using the camera on the robot arm, which is the view that you see here, to get a good eye on how Spartan is coming close. That's me at the robot arm. You see the trajectory at the bottom right corner of the screen there. That's the approach that we flew. The part I'm trying to grab is actually the bottom center of the screen. I'm using the target in the middle of the screen in order to aim and adjust my attitude properly so I can get a hold of Spartan. That all went very smoothly. Job did a, Jim did a superb job of setting me up for this grapple. Once we got a hold of Spartan, we then put it back in the payload bay. There had been some concern before the flight because earlier flights had had some problems with the latching mechanism. They had changed the hardware before this flight, and we were hoping it all went well, and indeed it did. It went right down into the guides and latched up on the first attempt, which was good news for the EVA guys champing at the bit to get out in the payload bay. And chomping we were. Bernard and I kept on looking at each other as the RMS slowly did its thing. <laughs> but here we are. We got outside. We were very happy. We waved to the camera and started our thermal evaluation. Well, I was the first guy on the arm. I got in with no problem. You see the arm is outfitted with a pad. And uh, once I got safely in, I grabbed a hold to Mike. And by the way, we're, we are tethered. Uh, shortly after that, uh, Veloji lifted us both up about 30 feet above the, the cargo bay for the coal soak. And during this time frame, actually, neither Bernardo nor myself felt particularly cold anywhere. 
It was only when we started to unbirth the Spartan and we moved into darkness at the same time. Here you see me on the end of the RMS, uh, moving it a little bit closer to Renard so he can grab a hold of it with a small handing tool and perform his uh, mass handing evaluation. During this time, I had full control. Once Mike handed it off to me, it was my job to take this almost 3,000 pound object satellite and wave it back and forth in the air. I only weigh about a 250 pounds, and, or 205 pounds, I should say. <laughs> He's getting lighter Thank all the time. God, I don't weigh 250 pounds. They wouldn't let me go in the shuttle. So it was a, it's not as an easy task as you may think. Uh, even though it didn't weigh anything, it does have a lot of mass. And uh, you can see here my initial starts and stops. I did not have the, uh, the satellite very square, and it was sort of a steep learning curve uh, at the very beginning. After a while, I got the hang of it, and uh, then it became uh, pretty, pretty easy. But the only way you can move masses like this is very, very slowly. I must say, Bernard did it extremely well. Initially, he said he had a, a lot of concern about doing it even slower than we had practiced on the air-bearing floor. But uh, as far as I could tell, he moved it without uh, cross-coupling anything uh, towards the end of his mass handling evaluation. I was steadily getting cold while watching him. And so we ended up uh, birthing the Spartan because of specifically very cold hands on my part, and I think Bernard had cold feet. After we'd been told to do the, uh, the birth, Bernard was able to practice his thermal mittens evaluation. Uh, after I did that, then it was uh, Mike's turn on the RMS. He, uh, he had been up there uh, freezing his toes and hands off at this point. And, uh, he had, did, actually did a close pass over an IMAX camera that we had in the payload bay, so you'll see some nice footage of that later. One of the things we do on every flight is look out the windows and take pictures for Earth observations, folks. One of our important jobs in the space program is to monitor the Earth's environment. You can see glaciers here in the southern Andes, Patagonia area. It's an area that we don't see very often on shuttle flights because we don't go to the high inclination that we had. We were at 51.6 degrees. This kind of terrain is of very interest to the Russian co-investigators on this flight because of the glaciers and watching the water runoff. But we do eventually have to come home. Ours was an eight-day flight. Morning of flight day nine, we packed up to go home. We had one last chance to say goodbye to the Mir space station. You'll see it in the center of this frame, and then you'll see a meteorite go by. Shuttle has a unique experience of having meteorites go below it. If you think ascent is exciting or the Mir rendezvous is exciting, uh, you wouldn't believe entry. The only way to take out the energy that we have put into the vehicle on liftoff is to come slamming into the atmosphere. There are not many molecules up high, but the ones that are there are screaming hot when you hit them. And you see the pink glow outside the windows. The flash is caused by the attitude control jets uh, firing. You'll see a scene looking back aft on this 25-mile trailing plume of fire as we come flying into the atmosphere. Uh, it was pretty dramatic for us because it was a night entry. Uh, we saw the sun as we approached the hack just briefly, uh, the large turning circle. So most of the entry was at night. The sun peaked its little head above the horizon and then dipped below again as we descended in our 100-ton glider with a lift to drag ratio of worse than 4 to 1 and reverse flight path control. Uh, but the system is very, very smooth. You see the turbulence uh, from inside, the 20 million candle power xenon lamps down on the runway, illuminating the runway, of course, from where we were, it looked like daytime. Uh, early morning, you'll see, uh, again, a flying over the threshold of the runway. You see some of the turbulence, but the vehicle handles it very well. It takes out all of the gusts and turbulence. You see some of the trailing edge vortices coming off of the wingtips in the next shot as we roll down the runway. Eileen will deploy the drag chute, and it disreefs just prior to nose wheel touchdown, which helps to reduce the loading on the main wheels and the nose gear. See the shuttle ch uh, chase airplane flying by. Mike said he could see some of the flash bulbs going off on the side. I wasn't looking in that direction. <laughs> Jim always told us not to look out the window, but I blew it. I might add that you feel quite heavy after coming back to Earth, uh, spinning over a week in zero gravity. When I took my helmet off, it felt like it weighed almost 75 pounds. <laughs> After Eileen uh, got rid of the drag chute, it was the first time we had used the brakes. The system is so good. 